Thank you very much. I think uh, that uh, the today opportunity of this uh, interesting meeting is in a moment uh, in which Europe is in the middle of uh, important election season, which uh, will have uh, historical consequences for the future and for the structure of Europe. After the French and the Greek elections, in a few days' time, we will have uh, uh, the, the Germans will vote in the North Rhine-Westphalia, and at the end of May, uh, in Ireland, uh, there will be the, uh, a referendum on the fiscal compton, and then, in September, the political elections in the Netherlands. The European people are pronouncing their opinions, and uh, their voice must be heard. We face two big risks. The first is a return to a populist-based nationalism that European history has already known as a source of a disaster. The second risk is the withdrawal of the European technocracies into an isolated black house. Populism will not be defeated with anathemas or with, with rhetoric, but with a real truth plus growth operation. The citizens must be told the truth about the end of a sustainability of a development model and about the need for bold reforms. Without growth, Europe cannot survive. Without growth, populism will win. Without a credible outlook for our citizens, Europe will fall. This outlook cannot only consist on sacrifices. The sacrifices must be linked to a scenario of economic and civil rebirth which European citizens are unable to see up to now. The European crisis uh, arises also from the inaction concerning the reforms. Do we, in Europe, uh, maybe uh, um, uh, we know that uh, uh, if we look at the initial leap in the European construction, considering that uh, today we are celebrating the anniversary of the Schuman Declaration, it was not a rhetoric. It, it was politics. It was uh, an investment on the potential for economic growth of a continent devastated by nas nationalism. It was an investment on a long-term outlook, a way to rise our eyes towards the future behind uh, the ruins of Europe of, after the World uh, War II. I think also that we are in the moment in which we need European leaders. European leaders that can share some crucial priorities. Not many points, but crucial priorities with the common efforts of European leaders looking at the future of uh, Europe. If uh, we rem maybe we remember the ambitions of the Lisbon Agenda, which uh, was to make the European economy the most competitive economy in the world. This strategy did not fall due to, the to some external powers and responsibility, but mainly because of the reforms in sense of growth and in sense of openness that should transform the European economies were never implemented, especially on the part of the economies in the southern countries. Europeanism is not rhetoric. Europe has to be attractive to Europeans and to non-Europeans. That was the attraction of Europe when Europe has produced growth and affluence. We have no other choice for defending populism and the risk of a return to a nationalism except to set the grow machine in motion through reforms and openness. And if we look at the euro, is the euro really dumb? 
we should uh, not take it for granted. It is dangerous to represent a prospect of failure, which would have immediate re repercussions also on the maintenance of the democracy on our continent. The greatest threat to democracy would be the collapse of the euro and the chaos that would ensure. It is, it is, however, essential to adjust our aim with regard to a process that has gone in a different direction for what had been imagined or born. When the euro was introduced, the prevailing opinion was that the tax discipline would be enough. This is not happened. Today, pragmatism and flexibility, pragmatism and flexibility are needed because my now by now, even the markets are suspicious of a rigorist fanaticism. But above all, the need for sacrifices must be linked to prospect for the growth, to give a goal, to give a challenge, to give something looking ahead and see the rebirth of the continent. A real opening up to the European market, apply European rules and regulations that had already exist demolishing national barriers that endure even 20 years after the birth and would produce greater economy opportunities. Let me just close. I don't want to open an important page, but this will take a lot of time regarding Italy and Europe. This maybe we leave later on. But if we look at the opportunities, the single market are more or less in, in Europe, 5 million consumers and 22 million enterprises. And Italy and Germany, in terms of manufacturing, are playing a crucial role. 22 million enterprises and can be an extraordinary instrument in the world of global competition. For goods, much has been done. But let us think of services, more liberalization, more opportunities of growth more markets, more uh, employees in the services and in a possible real opening up to the European market that would uh, yield between 60 and 140 billion in extra growth. It means more or less 1.5 of uh, between 1 and 1.5 of GDP. More Europe is needed against the crisis, not more barriers. Protectionism has never been and cannot be a solution. And if I say just one word on Italy, we need more Italy in Europe, but we need more Europe in Italy. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Montezemolo. We now have Barry Eichengreen, Professor Barry Eichengreen.